This video covers risk, return, and the security market line. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephen Haggard. Now we're going to find out what makes stock prices go up and down, and the short answer is news. Investors and traders bid stock prices up and down based on the arrival of news. However, not all news will move stock prices. Even news about the firm may not move the stock price because the news might be expected. So it's only the unexpected portion of news that moves stock prices because the expected portion is already priced in. Let's do an example here. If a company announces earnings per share of $1.04 and the market expected $1, only the four cent surprise moves the stock price. The market already had priced in the expected $1 announcement of earnings. Now, the unexpected portions are expected to average zero. Why? If they didn't average zero, they would be added to the expected earnings. There are two types of risk that we need to be concerned about. Systematic risks and unsystematic risks. What are systematic risks? Well, these are risks that influence a large number of assets, also called market risks. For example, the earthquake in Japan affected a large number of companies, all the way from Apple to General Motors, anybody whose supply chain went through Japan. Also, if you were in the nuclear power business, that earthquake was a systematic risk because it forced a reassessment of our dependence on nuclear power. So that's very definitely a systematic risk. Then we have unsystematic risks. These are risks that affect a single asset or a small group of assets, also called unique or asset-specific risks. For instance, the death of a popular CEO, for instance, Steve Jobs, that's an unsystematic risk. It really affects Apple. Did it cause problems at HP or at IBM? No so it's an unsystematic risk. Now you might say that there are lots of people who depend on making applications and accessories for the iPhone and that you might be able to argue then that Steve Jobs death was a systematic risk. Let's do a better example then of unsystematic risk. The president of a local beer distributorship dies in a tragic plane crash while it's tragic and sad, it would not be a systematic risk because it would really only affect the one firm. Now, what's the difference between unsystematic and systematic risk from an investor's perspective? Well, unsystematic risks can be diversified away. If the assets are not all moving in the same direction, if assets are moving in different directions as they would be with unsystematic risk, then by holding many assets, you can get rid of that risk. But systematic risk, ones that affect every asset or many assets, cannot be diversified away. Now we can combine the last two ideas that we've talked about and talk about unexpected news. We can break that unexpected news down into two components. A systematic portion, which would be surprising news that impacts a large number of assets, and an unsystematic portion, and that is surprising news that impacts a single asset or small group of assets. For instance, a systematic portion of, of surprising news would be, for instance, a higher unemployment report from the U.S. government than the market expected. Lots of people depend on people with jobs to buy their products and services, and as a result, unexpectedly high unemployment would be a systematic portion of surprising news. However, what if a CEO of a small firm was indicted on embezzlement charges? That would be surprising news that only impacts a single asset or small group of assets, so that would be an unsystematic portion of surprising news. Now we're going to look at what adding additional stocks to your portfolio does to the total risk of the portfolio. What we have over here in the left-hand column are the number of stocks in the portfolio. In the second column is the average standard deviation of annual portfolio returns. And in the third column is the ratio of the portfolio standard deviation to the deviation of a single stock. 
So, how did this experiment get done? Well, the authors over and over randomly chose one stock for that first line. They chose one stock. And of all the stocks that they chose, the average standard deviation of the portfolio of the returns for that stock were 49.24%. And so that's where that number came from. And of course, uh, the ratio of 49.24 to 49.24 is 1.0. Now, the next thing they did was randomly chose two stocks from the pool of available stocks and put them in a portfolio together and saw what the standard deviation of that portfolio would be. On average, those randomly drawn portfolios of two stocks had a standard deviation of 37.36%, which we can see is 76% the standard deviation of the single stock. So we were able to dump 24% of the risk by simply adding a second stock. That's pretty amazing. Now we're gonna double again the number of stocks in the portfolio. This time the authors chose out four stocks at a time and looked at the standard deviation of returns for a portfolio composed of those four stocks. And the average for those portfolios of four stocks was 29.69%, which is 60% the risk of a single stock portfolio. Now I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, we doubled again. But did the uh, risk drop another 24%? No, this time we dropped from 76% down to 60%. And so this is the first thing we need to know about diversification is that increasing numbers of assets reduces our risk but at a decreasing rate. In other words, we're going to see this thing kind of trail off and become asymptotal, which means it's going to become closer and closer to a value but not quite touch it. And so we'll see that here in a minute. But you can see as we go along and add more and more stocks that the <clears throat> this ratio, portfolio standard deviation to standard deviation of a single stock, gets lower and lower until we get down to 200 stocks. And then we're basically stuck in the neighborhood of 39%. Notice that whether you've got 200, 300, 400, 500, or 1,000, we're still stuck in this neighborhood of 39% of the standard deviation of a single stock. And so additional stocks help out diversification-wise, but it helps more when you're going from one stock to two stocks than when you're going from 500 stocks to 501 stocks. Also notice that there's a portion of risk that we just can't get rid of. If you haven't guessed it already, what we've been getting rid of was the unsystematic risk. That's the risk we said we could diversify away. What's left? It'll have to be a systematic risk, which we also call undiversifiable risk. Here's the same idea, but in a graphical format for you visual learners. Notice that the first stock, uh, down here, number of stocks and portfolios on the horizontal axis, and we have 49.2% standard deviation. And as we add stocks, that standard deviation comes down until it gets really close to 19.2%. But it doesn't drop below that 19.2%. Thus, 19.2% must be our level of non-diversifiable or systematic risk. That's the blue part. That's risk you just can't get rid of. But that tan greenish part is the diversifiable risk. That's part that we can get rid of by adding additional non-perfectly correlated assets to our portfolio. So far, the measure of risk that we have talked about has been return standard deviation. This is a measure of total risk, and we also call that volatility. But we've been learning that there are really two kinds of risk. There's systematic risk and there's unsystematic risk. So we need to come up with a measure for systematic risk. Now the market is only concerned with systematic risk. Why is that? Well, think about this. If you've got a bunch of people out there bidding on assets, People with well-diversified portfolios will only be bearing the systematic risk. Therefore, that's the only risk they will demand to be compensated for. And because they have lower required rates of return, they'll be able to offer higher amounts of money for the same cash flows going forward. Remember the price of or value of anything. 
is the present value of the future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the systematic risk. As a result, in every bidding war for an asset, the people with the diversified portfolios will always win. And as a result, they're the ones that set asset prices. That's why the market really only cares about systematic risk. Well, now that we know that, we know that we must come up with some sort of measure, some way to measure this systematic risk. And that measure is called beta. The easiest way to think of beta is to think of it as the slope of the characteristic line. What's the characteristic line? Well, it's a plot of the returns on a security versus the return on the market. And the greater the slope is of that line, the greater the systematic risk is of the security. In this example, slope, or beta, is equal to 1.5. For those of you who don't recall your mathematics training, slope is rise over run. That means for every 1% increase in the return on the market, the return on this stock must increase by 1.5%, so 50% more. So we could say roughly that this stock is 50% more risky than the market. Let's look at some betas for some selected stocks. Now the general idea here is that stocks that are less affected by systematic risk will have lower betas. Let's start with McDonald's. Do people stop going to eat at McDonald's when the economy gets bad? Perhaps somewhat, but McDonald's is actually considered a fairly low-end eatery. And so it makes sense that McDonald's would have a beta that's lower than that of the market. In other words, investing in McDonald's is less risky than investing in the S&P 500, which is our proxy for the market. American Electric Power is a utility firm. When times are tough, do people stop paying their electric bills and their water bills and so forth? Typically, that's one of the last things we stop paying. Typically, we'll let one of the cars go back and maybe even stop making our house payments. But we will continue to make our utility bill payments, so that's a good reason for the beta to be less than 1. MMM is 3M, or the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, and their beta is around 80% of that of the market. And then there's the publisher of your textbook. It's actually 1.08. In other words, when the market is up 1%, McGraw-Hill is up 1.08%. But when the market is down 1%, that means McGraw-Hill is also down 1.08%. And we move along, we get some riskier and riskier stocks. Now the interesting thing about these betas that we're looking at right here, in the last version of this textbook, the ordering on these was almost exactly reversed, with few exceptions. For instance, Disney had a beta of less than 1, and McDonald's had a beta of greater than 1. And so we know that beta is time varying, and in fact, we know that for companies like General Electric, the beta will vary over time because as the company moves along and the composition of the company changes as they buy and sell division, so will the beta because the beta is based on the riskiness of the assets that the company owns. You're probably wondering how to calculate beta for a portfolio. Well, unlike total risk, which is standard deviation for individual stocks, the systematic risk, or beta, is not reduced by the presence of non-perfectly correlated stocks. Remember, beta represents systematic risk, which is not diversifiable. Therefore, the beta of a portfolio is just the weighted average of the betas of the components of the portfolio, just like for return. So the beta of the portfolio is equal to the weight of component A times the beta of component A, plus the weight of component B times the beta of component B, and so forth until you cover all the components of the portfolio. Now that we know the measure of systematic risk is beta, we should be able to come up with some way to figure out what the required return on a security should be based on its beta. And that's what the security market line is all about. Now the security market line comes from a theory called the capital asset pricing model.
And so sometimes you may also hear this referred to as cap M, but it's all the same thing and you don't need to worry about uh, them being two different things. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a vertical axis that says expected return on the security. And then we have a horizontal axis, axis that says beta of the security. And we know that beta is a measure of how something performs versus the market. If something goes up 2% when the market's up 1% and goes down 2% when the market's down 1%, then that stock would have a beta of 2. So what does that mean the beta on the market itself is? Well, it has to be 1 because the market goes up by 1% when the market goes up by 1%. So by definition, the beta of the market must be 1. Now, what is the expected return on the market supposed to be? Well, if you look over, by the way, that M on the line stands for market. So down below M, we can see that the beta is 1, and over to the left, we have the expected return on the market. And then on the horizontal axis, we know that if there's no risk whatsoever, you can get the risk-free rate. And so now we have two points on a line. Now, if you remember your high school algebra, you can figure out the equation of a line given any two points on it using something called slope-intercept form. And that's exactly what we do with this security market line. Now our previous picture of the security market line is all well and good, but we need to be able to put this into an equation form so you can work problems on exams. And so what we have here is the expected return on security I, in other words, a stock, is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta sub I, that's the beta on stock I, multiplied by, and then we have the square brackets, and inside the square brackets are expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. Now let's talk about the individual pieces here. The expected return on the market is what we think the market is going to return in the coming year. The risk-free rate, you might see a problem that says the interest rate on treasury bills or the yield on treasury bills is such and such. That's your risk-free rate. And that piece in the square brackets is called the market risk premium. Now a lot of people get screwed up and they'll see a problem that says uh, the market risk premium is. And they'll take that number and they'll subtract the risk-free rate. That's wrong because you basically subtracted the risk-free rate twice. And so if the problem says the expected return on the market is, then you subtract the risk-free rate before multiplying by beta. However, if the problem says market risk premium is, then all you have to do is multiply that by beta. And once we multiply by beta, what do we get? Well, that's the risk premium on security I. How do I know that? Remember, any return over and above the risk-free rate is the risk premium. Well. Everything here above the risk-free rate is that piece over on the right-hand side beyond the plus sign. So it must be the risk premium for the security.